Mugabe villagers provide witness statements. Joe and Schultz battle stigma after COVID-19. And freight subsidy program expected to double. This is National MTV News with Helen Sear. Good evening, this is Tuesday's news. Thanks for your company. Locals at Gabi Village and NCD have provided witness statements to police to assist in investigations into a police raid conducted in the village some weeks back. This incident is one of the many reported cases on human rights violation during the enforcement of the COVID-19 security operations. Today at 10 a.m., Director of the Police Internal Investigation Unit, Robert Ali, and NCD Metropolitan Superintendent Peru Drano visited Gabi Village to comment talks on how locals will assist with police investigations. Investigations into police conduct, which locals had described as abuse of human rights. So I'm going to talk to my plan, and my plan put in control law. Some weeks back, when enforcing emergency orders put in place by the State of Emergency Controller, police officers conducted a raid at Gabi Village. The raid was part of the betonut ban that was being executed within NCD during the State of Emergency. There was a confrontation between police and locals which escalated into vendors allegedly attacking a police car. Police reinforcement was called in and that led to reports of raid and mostly abuse in human rights. The information that you, you, you've given us, uh, uh, without preempting uh, the information on the file, I cannot say anything until our investigators actually looks at the information on the file. Then, from their professional, you know, judgment, they think they are other people or they are linked to other people, they will come to it. So you will see our investigators coming in and out of the village. Or better still, you can make the same arrangement as the four other people. The team of police officers who visited Gabi today received a petition from locals, including witness statements that will assist police in its internal investigations. What do you have? Uh done so far is helping us and our internal affairs to do the job properly and to complete this investigation the way it should be. And once again, whatever the facts that we get is only through your good support. Sekla Gunga, National MTV News. Police are questioning five suspects in relation to the sexual assault on the wife of a police officer attached to the Special Services Division or SSD. The incident occurred in the early hours of Saturday morning near the Moitaka Ridge area at Nine Mile Settlement located close to the SSD base at McGregor Police Barracks. Details surrounding this incident are still unclear. However, it is believed the victim left McGregor Police Barracks, where she resides with her husband. On her way to Moitaka Ridge, she was sexually assaulted by a group of men who were under the influence of liquor. <laughs> Law, hand law, law. So thank you, Mibla Panimia, all this line, all creating, all Bagarab, all community, so Mibla Lusim, no law, finish. The five suspects who are now in police custody were accused of sexually assaulting the victim on the early hours of last Saturday morning. They were handed over to police after a group of police officers entered the Moitaka Ridge area and bent down few houses following reports of the sexual assault. Um, all police to assembly line, you blow, come, you blow, Miss Abos and Mem, Big Blas Antin and Red and Big Blas Antin, so Mamma Simbarab, so Miss Abos and Blacham want to fresh them, but please, Miblacom Nidino, 
Okay, the community no make him distance one, one to two, make him yeah, Mibla community must talk sorry. Mibla by talk sorry. The Nine Mile Clinic, which is located in the affected community, has since remained closed as of the weekend. NCD Metropolitan Superintendent Pero Drano is expected to give further details on this incident, but he has confirmed the surrender of some suspects who are now in police custody. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. A family in Leys mourning the loss of their father after he was stabbed last week at Bumayong. John Cedric was the provincial village court coordinator. He was stabbed when four criminals robbed him of his phone and other belongings. He died of his injuries in hospital. While efforts to curb petty crime within the city limits is ongoing, communities are seeing an increase in crime. In Bumayong last week, a senior provincial village court official, John Cedric, was stabbed by four men. He died of his wounds two days later. Witnesses said he was stabbed during the robbery. His wife, Lindy, and their three children are still coming to terms with the death. This like died long, ma'am. Was them they making me in a beginning where I stopped one behind pain. Was them as a young family, and um, um, all beginning to them, Emino looks and banana of Savile of Future of Lord Boston. Me as a young mother, and me by struggle to insult this lap pain, but me struggle to look at this lap triple picking. Cedric served the province as a care for over 10 years. He was promoted to the provincial village court coordinator position last year. A promotion, according to his wife, came with very little benefits. So, how we block me plus table 30 minutes walk here. Lomaus Road, now Guantalo, area block plan, now go down there. So, I'm so go come with him. Since I'm kissing this promotion, I'm so walk about with him. Go come. Sometimes I'm tired. I'm coming tired and I'm sitting down Malolo Golo Road and I'm going to Laos. I'm going to make him say, I'm going to come now. Coming up this time where Monday 11th, I'm going to walk and come back long and I'm going to be slave in the road. Administration is going to be now. All by making money and something to me in the beginning. I understand. Because I'm going to be a big man in the province where I'm going to be a big man. I make him big work in the district. I must play district and save him come in a not look savvy. Similar to another incident last year in West Taraka, a young man was stabbed multiple times by criminals after he refused to hand them his tablet. In lay, incidents like this often lead to clashes between ethnic groups and lay Metropolitan Police Commander Chief Inspector Chris Kunyomban said police are closely monitoring the situation in Bumayong. Dispatch the one of the sections here as plus the as well as the SRU unit. They went up there at the back of uh, Bumayong where a lot of minimums were there. Uh, they had a word with them, they have audience with them. Uh, there is understanding uh, at the moment, but yes, it's quiet, but it's tense. And uh, currently, as I speak to, we are monitoring the situation. Police have arrested two suspects and are working with community leaders to apprehend the rest. Shalin Eri, National MTV News, Lay. Seven senior officers this morning were appointed to the positions of Deputy Commissioner and Assistant Commissioner by the Correctional Services Commander Stephen Pocanis. These senior officers are expected to work in partnership with the CS Minister and the CS Commander to rebuild the organisation. The appointment of the Deputy Commissioners, Assistant Commissioners and Acting Assistant Commissioners are to form the Correctional Services Executive Team. Among them were two Senior Female Correctional Services Officers who were appointed as Acting Assistant Commissioners. Application for each position went through strategic screening before selections were made. Amendment was also made in the uh, Correctional Service Regulation. That amendment was done in 2015. That regulation in Section 5 of the uh, amendment that was done in 2015 regulates or gives the guidelines on the appointment of the Deputy and the Assistant Commissioners. The powers on appointing the Deputy and Assistant Commissioners falls now within the Commissioner. 
appointed Deputy Commissioner for Corporate Affairs was Michael Mosiri. David Suago was appointed Deputy Commissioner for Operations, Commanding Officer for Bicycle Correctional Institute. Chief Superintendent Timmy Kaugla was appointed Assistant Commissioner for Southern Region, Commanding Officer for Biotech Correctional Institute. Superintendent Simon Lakeng was appointed Assistant Commissioner for Highlands Region. Superintendent Vincent Nai Kundi was appointed Assistant Commissioner for Bougainville Correctional Services. Chief Superintendent Philip Pranis, the former commanding officer of Manus Correctional Institute, is now the Assistant Commissioner for New Guinea Islands Region. Superintendent Francisca Maring was appointed Acting Assistant Commissioner for Policy Planning and Evaluation. And Patty Correa will continue her role as Acting Assistant Commissioner for Personal, Finance and Administration. Correctional Service Senior Executive and Appointment Board uh, that is headed by Sir Paul Songo and his um, members. Uh, they went through the applications that went before them and out from that they made the selections and the selections were done independently. CS Commissioner Stephen Pokanis also took the time to acknowledge his senior retiring officers. These officers were Deputy Commissioner Operations Dennis Piandi, Assistant Commissioner Henry Wavik, Assistant Commissioner Philip Ecker, and Assistant Commissioner David Kanonbaum. Retiring Deputy Commissioner Operations Dennis Piandi clocked almost 47 years with the Correctional Services. It takes time, but uh, I congratulate you too. As the Commissioner said, put your heads together and work as a team, I think you'd get there. This man had served their entire life with the Papua New Guinea Correctional Services. A parent will be held on behalf of the senior officers to send them off. Michelle Steven, National MTV News. It's been two months since the first reported positive case of COVID-19 was announced in East New Britain province. And after more than a month of isolation, Joanne Schultz, the COVID-19 patient, has come out publicly to speak of her ordeals. While the PNG government sees COVID-19 as a virus that needs to be contained, Ms. Schultz says there is a human side of COVID-19 that needs a voice. She says since going into isolation, she hasn't been battling with the coronavirus, but stigma and discrimination. People do die from stigma. And I want the public to know that, that it, is, it won't be coronavirus that will kill you. It, you'll end up dying from stigma. And I need people to understand that and the public to understand that, that, that what you say, what you project negative, negatively will affect the patient that is confirmed with this virus. And I think it sets a lot of fear into the patients now and the other cases that have been um, confirmed. And for me, knowing the discrimination and stigma I went through publicly on social media throughout the country, I think um, the public then learned from my case. You're watching National MTV News. Among stories after the break, freight subsidy program expected to double and police sea patrol. Details after the break. Welcome back. Planning Minister Sam Bussell says he expects the number of containers of vegetables shipped to Port Moresby to double in the coming month as farmers take advantage of the government freight subsidy program. The number of containers jumped from 50 to 70 containers. The planning department says they are studying the shipments to determine an optimum number and prevent an oversupply for food. This is the first shipment that arrived in Port Moresby this week. The highest number of container shipments the contractor Bismarck Shipping has done is 50. And this shipment hit close to the mark at 48. The next shipment due to arrive in Port Moresby in a few days has more than 70 containers. Planning Minister Sam Basil, who spoke on Christian Radio's COVID-19 awareness program, said they expect the number to double this month, exceeding initial expectations. Instead of emergency making and plan making fast, if MIPLA go a normal process, we will still suffer in Moresby for another one month or two months before we recover, when everything takes shape again. So 
The COVID-19 intervention in agriculture is only for a short term, but it's already given an insight into what freight demands are like for the Highlands provinces. The department team is studying how much food Port Moresby will need before the city reaches saturation point and prices and profit margins start to drop. So we have to act quickly to make sure that we find a way to make sure that those containers now Miplo Salimigo, it must mitigate them cost down in price come down. The program will be expanded to include other shipping companies and land transport companies, but their inclusion will depend on the lessons learned from this initial program. Scott Whitey, National MTV News, Lay. 72% of schools in the country are complying to state of emergency orders in the education sector. Acting Education Secretary Dr. Uke Kombra says this is acceptable despite efforts made by schools. Dr. Kombra says social distancing remains a challenge amidst concerns of lesson recovery and others. Dr. Combra made his statement during a development forum held recently in Port Mosby. He says the 72% compliance is from a survey carried out by education authorities in 849 schools. Southern region had the highest compliance with 76%. From the Highlands region we got 71%, uh, Southern region 76% compliance. Uh, New Guinea Highlands, 74% compliance, and Momasi, 63% compliance. The survey include establishment of water taps, sinks, use of sanitizers, masks, and other health preventive measures outlined by SOE controller David Manning. Dr. Combra says apart from these, many challenges remain as schools cope with shift classes and recovery lessons. He says the education department is scaling down options to improve and adapt to the new normal. Other challenges is making sure that we don't have, uh, we, we can prepare for disasters with lessons. So it's not just the normal uh, period times when we give out lessons, but also we have to cater for periods like when we will have disasters. Mm -hmm. So those are some things we are also learning that uh, where our shortfalls were. With schools almost closed for six weeks, resumption of the academic year has been slow. The education department has initiated different modes of providing classes through a software. Dr. Combra says this is vital and may be applied in areas faced with disasters or other pandemics. Uh, the name of the company is called Pure Med Solutions. Uh, they worked with us to develop a, um, a software, uh, an application, that you can actually uh, go into the computer and Look at all the lessons that we are delivering, they are all content, so we're going to continue with that. The report of the survey has been presented to authorities at NOC 19. Jagla Pava Jr. National MTV News. Lays Metropolitan Commander Chris Konyanban says they will be continuing with CCTV installations this week at Airco in Lay. This follows the first one that was set up in town to monitor the town bus stop and surrounding areas, which have been a hotspot for petty crimes and loitering. With the Airco CCTV installed, Lay police will be able to monitor the three main centres, Airco, Market and Town. Kunyanban said once all these are in place, there are long-term plans in place to further improve on this. Eventually, when uh, things are good, we will go to the extreme of putting up the CCTV so we can bounce up the leak from CCTV here. So we monitor all the cars coming in and out of the town from Bumang and up. So in the, in the event you have a problem with the SMV, SMV stands for stolen motor vehicles. You have uh, vehicles wanted for other offenses. It's easy for us to trace using the number plate. Yeah, this is a long term program, but currently you see now uh, the this that is up on the roof there. We are adjusting it for the internet so we capture all the reports every report should be captured um, uh, because the reports are 57 days on since the detection of PNG's first positive case and the number still stands at 8. Prime Minister James Marape this afternoon gave his reassurance that all funds coming into the National Operations Centre will be audited. This also includes funds and donations from development partners and organisations abroad and how much is being spent to procure equipment for frontline workers. And as I did indicate in one press uh, sometimes earlier, every pool of funds coming in for our COVID-19 program 
is all channeled into one account, and that one account has oversight from our donor partners also because their funds also are coming into that that same same one trust account. It's an ex existing HSIP trust account that is also supported of funds from Australia government, funds from World Bank, and etc. All going to one account. So there's a minimal chance of uh, funds being abused. So let me give confidence to everyone. There's no one here trying to you know, put on a program that will seep on fun elsewhere and do, a, you know, running a little agenda elsewhere. If you media are interested about abuse of fun, check what has happened in APEC. Continue asking APEC. Me as former finance minister and those of us who are involved in APEC, ask them. Ask us. Go and do investigation in APEC. What has happened to APEC fund or 2015 uh, SB Games fund? Uh, there are much, much more millions of kina involved in those transactions than the 23 million kina you are all asking about all the time. Uh, but for the COVID exercise, there will be a total report on this one. We'll get outside uh, the Public Accounts Committee has made the int intention known to come and uh, oversight on what we're doing. We welcome very much them coming in to see what we are doing. But we also welcome anyone to come and have a look at how we've been operating here. There's a protocol team uh, in place. I beg your pardon, there's a procurement team in place. This procurement team will ensure that all procurement is done consistently with the procurement manual that uh, our SOE uh, team has set up to ensure good governance. Lace Mobile Squad 13, based at Ramon Nickel Refinery at Basamoka, conducting awareness, sea surveillance and monitoring of boats along Rye Coast area during the SOE period. According to reports from local police, boat owners and passengers are complying with basic safety measures that include washing of hands prior to boarding of boats. This is the third week members of the Lay Mobile Squad 13 based at Basamuk Refinery area are conducting sea patrol along the coastline. Police do checks to ensure boats are equipped with a bucket of water for hand washing. However, social distancing remains a challenge for passengers due to limited space in the boat. According to police reports, there were no incidents reported so far. Locals are now adhering to instructions and are appreciative of the police presence out at sea. At Bilbil Point, inspections are still maintained and boats have become familiar with the routine check every morning and afternoon. At least 83 local boats from the impacted communities around Basamuk plant site have been traveling to and from Medang. Police will maintain patrol during the SOE period. Martha Louise, National MTV News, Medang. And now looking at the NAS fund market report, the Kina opened unchanged at 0.29 US dollars in the interbank markets. At Bank South Pacific, Yokina is buying 0.2825 US dollars, 0.43 Australian dollars, 0.2511 Euro and 29.67 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading higher, cocoa closed higher, while copra and coffee closed higher. Palm oil closed higher, crude oil is trading higher and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed higher, the ASX is trading higher, and the All Ordinaries is trading higher. You're watching National MTV News, stories making headlines overseas. When we come back, stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, Australian barley growers have been left reeling after Chinese government locked in massive new tariffs overnight. Last night, Beijing confirmed it would put an 80% tariff on barley. The decision will effectively end trade worth up to $1.5 billion a year. 
look, on the face of it, and being dispassionate, the case against these Bali, uh, the, the case that China has mounted on these Bali tariffs does look very weak indeed. Now, the, the allegation that China is making is that the Australian government is effectively subsidising the cost of Bali production to dump it uh, at a very cheap rate into the uh, Chinese market. But most of the subsidies that the Chinese government is actually complaining about uh, don't apply to many barley farmers. For example, the uh, drought assistance and water efficiency measures for the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, most of those payments don't go to Australian barley farmers. They're, they're typically out west. So the government is suspicious simply because that this, this case does on the face of it look so weak. Now, the other thing, of course, to say is that this doesn't come in isolation. Uh, the government, as we know, has uh, been facing a number of uh, tricky moments, if you like, in its relationship with China. And we saw not long ago another measure whacked on Australian beef imports by China. So that's one of the reasons that the government doesn't believe that this is entirely coincidental. That said, it's also true that this specific dispute about barley hasn't come to a head out of nowhere. It started 18 months ago and it was always going to come to a conclusion about now. In fact, exactly now. So it is possible that it's all come together as a coincidence, but the government at the very least is suspicious about the confluence of all of these things. And even if this decision isn't a result of the bad relationship with China, it's quite possible that it was influenced by it. Now, the Agriculture Minister, David Littleproud, was trying to take a really conciliatory approach when he was asked about this question today, insisting that Australia is not in a trade war with China. Let's take a listen to what he had to say. Unless you have evidence to the contrary to say that, that this Bali decision is predicated on that, uh, then uh, you, can't, you can't make those assertions. They are dangerous assertions to make. This is, a, this is a process that started 18 months ago, well before COVID-19 came into place, and this was the juncture, uh, coincidentally, of when it had to come to a decision. So uh, I, I think you, you, you're trying to speculate wildly. Uh, they have given reasons, which we are working through now, and if we do not agree with those reasons, we'll take it to the umpire. Uh, that's what you do calmly and methodically. There is no trade war. Everyone needs to take a deep breath, take a cold shower and understand that we produce the best food and fibre in the world and we have marketplaces that we'll be able to send our barley and other produce into other markets uh, if our producers wish to do so. The grim COVID-19 statistics are piling pressure on the World Health Organization at its first members meeting since the outbreak. The global body again forced to defend its response, pledging a wide-reaching pandemic inquiry. But some say it's letting China off too easy. COVID-19 has now stained every corner of the globe. While each nation is facing its own battles, last night they shared a common goal. We have seen what's possible with cooperation. Global cooperation. Global cooperation. The World Health Organization committing to a probe into its pandemic response. To review experience gained and lessons learned and to make recommendations to improve national and global pandemic preparedness. As case numbers in the US continue to swell, officials there blamed the WHO. There was a failure by this organization to obtain the information that the world needed, and that failure cost many lives. More than 90,000 of those in the US. And from the White House, President Donald Trump reloading his war of words with China. They've hurt themselves also, but they've hurt the world very, very badly. Yeah, they should be held responsible. The US and Australia are spearheading the push for an inquiry into the origins of coronavirus widely believed to be here in Wuhan, and how China responded to it. But a majority of WHO member states are supporting an arguably watered-down review of how all nations responded. We very much hope that all member states join with us in taking the steps towards a new era of global solidarity. After weeks of pressure, China's president is now backing the inquiry on one condition, not before the virus is contained. The US is now threatening to permanently pull its funding to the WHO unless it proves it's not coerced by China. They're a puppet of China. President Xi turned a new page in his pandemic playbook, pledging $3.3 billion to arm the world's war on the virus, more than making up for the US's shortfall. We do not need a review to tell us that we must all do everything in our power to ensure this never happens again. A big step in learning from a situation we were woefully unprepared for. 
Tens of millions of workers in India who moved to the country's cities to find work lost their livelihoods when they went into lockdown. Now they're moving on. Hundreds of thousands of people are hitting the road to find their way back to their villages. For weeks now, the Indian government has insisted these people just don't exist. They're the hordes of workers from big cities whose bosses often give them somewhere to live. Now they're unemployed and desperate to return to their villages. We want to pretend that this isn't happening. And we want to forget that we're now entering the fifth week of the lockdown. And I'm going to try and talk to some of the women here they walk really fast. Didi, your name? Barker Dutt is one of India's most famous journalists. She's been working with me so we can tell you this story together. Your name is Rahul. Rahul, how many days are you going? Come, 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 अब वहाँ क्या टेरे खाना पीना भी तो नहीं दे रही थी सरकार इसलिए अब पैसे भी नहीं थे हम आ गए अब हम क्या करें लेकिन कोरोना का तो आपने सुना होगा कि अभी हिलना ठीक नहीं है कोरोना का तो सुना था अब लेकिन अब क्या करें वहाँ पे तो उधर पड़े पड़े क्या करते भूखे मरते इसलिए आ गए हम पैदल पैदल और अभी और कितना किलोमीटर चलना है अभी दो किलोमीटर और चलना है दो किलोमीटर और हाँ और जहाँ आप काम क्या करते थे जहाँ थे हम जीरा तोड़ते थे तो जीरा जो तोड़ते थे आपको क्या तनखा देना बंद हो गया था हाँ तनखा बंद दे देना हो गया था वो चुका स्पोर्ट्स नेक्स्ट इलाजल अवैध जॉइंस अस एट द स्पोर्ट्स डेस्क Thank you, Helen. I'll have some news on protocols for the resumption of sporting events. Join me after the break. Sports. Welcome to True Kai Sports. The PNG Sports Foundation have come up with a back to sport COVID-19 protocol. This protocol will enable PNG Sports Foundation to initiate an active data monitoring system in all venues. Many sporting federations are eager to get back into competition for the remainder of the year. After close consultation with the Sports Foundation medical staff, under the guidance of Dr. Kapua Kapua, who was appointed to help the team at the venue management as they made the sporting venue available for the national government to use during this time and taking into heed the SOE controller's requirements, they were able to put together a back to sports protocol. Uh, it will be the same document that will give confidence to the SOE controller that we have our measures put in place and that it's in line with his standards and conditions of getting back into the new normal and that will give him the, the uh, uh, maybe the uh, opportunity for him to announce to be a lot more flexible for us for sports in the next six months or so. International sporting federations have their own set of protocols for the new normal in which the national federations will also have to apply in the technical areas. The back to sports protocols ensures international standards set by the different international federations are considered. The PNG Sports Foundation have now released or is about to release our get back into sports protocol that now will allow each and every one of your stakeholders, including the national federations and all those that uh, are playing active sports within our communities, that there are now protocols in place for sports. And that by abiding to these protocols, you will also be in line with what the government uh, has put in place. The pandemic has also let the PNG Sports Foundation come up with a strategy to monetize different sports and make sure everyone that enters the venues are accounted for. We must be able to monitor and we must be able to identify individuals that come into our facilities. And hence, the PNG Sports Foundation has now put together mechanisms that we're going to activate uh, in, in, gen, uh, in June that will ensure that everyone who will use our facilities must be accounted for. 
The national federations will have to manage their space. Hockey has begun by putting a fence to manage spectators and people that enter the venue. They're just now in line with what we're trying to uh, put in place for us uh, in terms of managing our people, uh, managing our spectators and our stakeholders coming into our facilities and enjoying our facilities. And like I said, more importantly for us to be compliant, to be globally compliant, is that this will allow us to trace everyone that comes in and uses and enjoys our facility. The Back to Sports protocol does not only apply to Port Moresby competitions, but other provinces as well who will have to comply with the protocols. Netballers in Port Moresby will have to make do with the Sir John Guy Stadium facility. The home of Port Moresby Netball, the Rita Flynn Court, is serving as the isolation center for COVID-19 in the city. The Port Moresby Netball competition will be moving to the Sir John Guy Stadium once they are ready to start their competition. The announcement was made by Peter Siamalile Jr., Executive Director of the PNG Sports Foundation today. We've considered that netball will be played here at Sir John Guy Stadium. We'll have to talk about that. Netball is very big, very big because they've got from senior right down to juniors. Netball uh, executives are here. The home of Port Mosby Netball, the Rita Flynn Courts, is currently serving as Port Mosby's isolation facility for COVID-19. Tia Malili says that only the state of emergency controller, Police Commissioner David Manning, will give an indication when the facility will return to the netballers. Uh, we will take a cue from the uh, SOE controller on when exactly when uh, we can... Uh phase back into uh, getting uh, Rita Flynn to having the stakeholders or the key guys to get back in there was a netballer back to uh, Rita Flynn. As it stands to now, we won't know until the SOE gives us the cue. Moving the competition to Sir John guys might have some implications to it. With up to 250 to 300 young females entering the Rita Flynn facility on Saturdays to play netball, utilizing the outside courts including the indoor facility. With a total of over 20 clubs, the main clubs being Sparrows, Telsters, Mermaids, Rebels and Raukele have grades in each of the divisions from juniors to seniors. Other clubs have three to four teams in each division. Having all scheduled matches on one day at the Sir John Guy Stadium will be impossible. But Siamalili has given an alternative. He says the netball competition will have to spread out their matches over a period of a week if they want to have all scheduled matches completed. Some competitions uh, you may have to play it over a period of a week. So during the week the facilities will be heavily active because you'll be playing your competitions during the week as opposed to just playing it over the weekend. And we'll work, we'll work with the sports, you know, we'll work with the sports. Fidel is looking at Trukai Sports. And Trukai Sports continues with Super Rugby and Basketball after this break. Stay with us. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Chukai Sports. All Blacks lock Scott Barrett has confirmed his rugby future in New Zealand. Barrett's recommitted to the Crusaders and the National Union until after the 2023 World Cup. Scott Barrett making a big push towards 2023. Yeah, to have a, an opportunity to have a crack at the next World Cup, um, all going well uh, with form and... Um, yeah, so I've given myself the opportunity. Barrett's new deal comes right when the All Blacks have depth concerns in the locking department. Sam Whitelock's approaching the end of his career and Brody Retallick's unavailable until 2021. The 26-year-old's new contract doesn't include a sabbatical clause, but does have an option for a later Super Rugby season start. Even on where I feel my body's at after a potential um, yeah, heavy couple of seasons, but yeah, that'll play out in the years to come. Barrett will also continue to represent Taranaki and could still turn out for his home province in this year's Mighty 10 Cup with uncertainty around the test calendar. Well, if the competition Mighty 10 gets up and rolling um, and there's an opportunity to play the old, uh, yeah, grab the jersey with both hands. So, um, yeah, it's certainly an exciting prospect. Another exciting prospect could be linking up with older brother Bowden in Taranaki Colours. But there's no brotherly love lost. Scott not having a bar of Bowden's record-setting Bronco fitness tests with the Blues. I'm not surprised, to be honest. He's 
had probably like a six month preseason, if not longer, um, to come back into training. So. Um, yeah, the Bronco went well for us as well. The middle Barrett brother now hoping to raise the bar even higher with the Red and Blacks and grind it out with them until the next World Cup. After a significant initial pushback, a revamped National Basketball League will begin in just over a week. Seven teams have committed to the five-week tournament to be held in Auckland. The competition featuring two new teams and one returning a year earlier than expected. Justin Nelson's had many a restless night trying to get the NBL off the ground. Uh, I haven't slept for eight weeks and uh, yeah, I look no doubt there's a lot of things that go through your mind. Um, th there's a lot of planning that goes into this and the job's just begun. But his head can at least hit the pillow content with a new look league of seven teams and 56 games. He's faced ongoing pushback from some. At one stage just three teams were interested and despite missing the two sides who between them have won the last seven times titles in the Wellington Saints and Southland Sharks, Nelson's slanting that as a positive. What's really exciting is as we head into 2021 and hopefully a return to normality, that's 10 NBL franchises in the Selves NBL. So looking ahead, we can't wait to have those teams back with us. There's intrigue in two of the teams that will take part, one brand new, another returning after a long absence. The Franklin Bulls currently literally building from the ground up at their home in Pukekohe. We've been waiting a while and you know we got injected into the league um, late last year and we were really excited to sort of get started and it all come to a halt with the COVID-19 but uh, positive things are happening and this looks like we're all on track again. The Otago Nuggets meanwhile are already on the floor for their first appearance since 2014. Back then I would have been around 15 and it was always a goal of mine to play for the Nuggets and obviously when they left it left kind of a bit of a gap in that development pathway but now them being back it's a yeah, dream come true. The team face unique challenges and experiences in the new look competition including a draft and three games a week. Coaches forced to think differently. Minutes will be important easing guys into it, strategising kind of you know what that looks like game one through three but it's great. There's been some pushback but basketball in New Zealand is definitely on the rebound. And that story wraps up Trukai Sports. Helen will be back with the weather details for the next 24 hours. Stay with us. Kai Sport. True Kai Sport. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecasts in the southern region. Fine, although cloudy in Port Moresby, Daru and Kerama. Showers then cloudy, partly cloudy in Alatau and Popandita. In the Mamasa region, fine, although partly cloudy with afternoon showers developing in Lee. Partly cloudy in Wewak and Bunnymore. Mostly fine weather in Medang. In the New Guinea Islands region, partly cloudy with a shower or two in Loringal, Kokopo and Rabaul. Fine, although partly cloudy in Kaviang, partly cloudy in Buka and a shower or two in Kimbe. And in the Highlands region, fine, although partly cloudy right across the region in Mount Hagen, Garoka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabag. Forecast for all coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres, through Torres Strait to Daru to Hood Point to Aroma Coast to Samar Island to eastern and western Melon Bay Islands and from Sialum to Vitiaz and Dampier Straits to Long Island to Karkar Island to Bogia to Wewak to Aitape to northern PNG Indonesian border and Manus and its western group of islands including Musau and Emirau Islands and Kaviang and the Coral Sea. Strong southeast wind surge of 25 to 33 knots are expected to continue for the next 24 hours, causing rough seas and high wind waves. All small crafts and boats are advised to take necessary precautions before going out to sea. 
forecast for small crafts within the coastal waters of Papua New Guinea for the next 24 hours. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait to Daru Island to Hood Point to Samari Island seas of 2 to 3.5 meters. Waters of Kiwa Island to Gulf of Papua to Kerama to Yul Island seas of 0 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Waters of Samari Island and Eastern and Western Milne Bay Island seas of 2 to 2.5 meters. Waters of East Cape to Cape Vogel to Finch Half End seas of 0 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Waters of Finch Half End to Sea Lum through Vitias and Dampier Straits to Sea Sea Island to Long Island and with waters of Long Island to Medeng, Karkar Island to Bogia to Wewek to Aitape to Northern PNG Indonesian border seas of 2 to 3 meters. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands, including waters of New Ireland, seas of 1.5 to 2.5 meters, and waters of East and West New Britain and Bougainville, seas of 1.5 to 2 meters. Ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea, seas rough to high seas with southeast winds at 25 to 33 knots increasing to 45 knots in the Solomon Sea seas moderate with east to southeasterly winds at 15 to 20 knots in the Bismarck Sea seas moderate to patches rough with southeast winds at 20 to 30 knots and in the Pacific Ocean seas moderate to patches rough with northeast to easterly winds at 20 to 25 knots The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that's the new sport and weather for today, Tuesday, the 19th of May, 2020. On behalf of the news team, pleasant viewing. Good night.